The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco in the northern part of the greatest state in the nation, and my guest will agree with me on that. Uh, I have this wonderful segment, Two Jews, Three Opinions, that the um, Jew in question is Howie <laughs> Gordon. How you doing? Well, I haven't been referred to as the Jew in a long time, but it's always great to identify with just the tribe. Great to be, just great to be on top of the ground just for one more day, but the kids don't ever come to visit. Oi, oi, they don't call Martin. Martin. <laughs> Howie, I got, I thought you, and you are the first to know that it is absolutely official. Um, Sports Byline USA and the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network have teamed up to produce Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. Wow. It's going to be on 200 some odd affiliates, um, F, series F, FM, uh, XFM, all these things that I didn't even know existed in a, in a lot of ways. Um, one of them, though, that I did know existed was Armed Forces Radio. Yeah. And um, proud to be on that as a, um, for a number of reasons. Number one reason is. A lot of people will be listening in places that uh, don't provide very much entertainment. Yeah. So anything we can do to cheer up folks who are um, estranged from their way of life and are um, in bumfuck Egypt or this, that, and the <laughs> other thing, um, it'll be nice to entertain those people from the standpoint of my being a, a former GI. Um, I wasn't stationed anywhere but California, <laughs> but that, that's another thing. Um, I got to know a lot of people that were stationed um, at that time was the Vietnam era, and um, what, what they went through, what veterans uh, continue to go through from that era, how they suffer with um, the effects of Agent Orange, of P PDT or whatever, um, it, stuff we didn't even know existed back then. Yeah. Um, so cheering up um, or at least taking people's mind off of their plight as radio will do um, because it is the theater of the mind. And conversely, TV is the theater of the mindless. I don't remember who said that or originally, but I'm proud to to be. I would vote for Newton show. Minow. Do you remember Newton Minow? It was yes, Newton Minow. Um, he referred to TV as the vast wasteland, which which was repeated by endless journalists. It, it became the one of the great criticisms in the in the 1960s of uh, what was on the airwaves, the the banality of the Donna Reed show, etc. Multiplied by everything. Oh yes. Um, and when we grew up, radio was absolutely spellbinding. Well, I miss that. I miss that. I'm, yes. uh, I was born in 48, exactly 69 and 364, 365th days a year, years ago. <laughs> All right. Tomorrow, tomorrow is my 70th birthday is what I'm trying to say. Uh, well, I, 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 I awoke to TV. I, uh, that was radio was not an event in our house. Uh, the TV was, and uh, it was uh, a brand new and a big box and a big event to have one. And you know, a lot of people didn't. And uh, but I, I missed uh, all the all the radio generation of entertainment. And it was interesting to see how some of the radio performers transcended. And uh, Jack Benny is one that comes to mind. Right? Yeah, no way. No. How. Um, all the Burns and Allen, they were all yeah. radio people, and some had uh, the persona for TV, some didn't. Um, 
Well, it's Some interesting. Had I had just uh, recently read the biography of Ed McMahon. And uh, like the same with silent movies versus talkies, when something first begins, whoever is successful in the older medium tends to poo-poo the new one because they've already achieved what they wanted to achieve working in the old, so they want to see it as a flash in the pan that's going to go away. And consequently, in television, working as an entry uh, with, with the beginning of the, the genre, uh, McMahon got all these jobs because nobody wanted them. Um, he became a, ho- a television show host himself, and I think Philadelphia was his hometown. Um, and he had four or five different jobs on different shows because there was no competition. They, nobody knew what it was. They were inventing it as they went. And um, he managed to prosper because there was no competition um, in the beginning. So there's a lot of people who uh, just didn't think television was going to make it. And it would be a drop in prestige and status to get involved with this flim flam kind of thing, uh, and they didn't go for it. And it's only as it developed and became profitable that the Burns and Allenses and the people who were successful in radio made the transition to the TV. Oh, they, were, uh, they didn't jump in right away. No, that was it was considered a demotion. It'd be like podcasting uh, versus broadcasting. Um, you know, nowadays, although that, that transition is already pretty well along where um, the Internet is redefining show business now. Um, happily so, or I'd be told. <laughs> yes, because you're on the new side yeah, of things. Yeah, like, like a, a movie star that, that we know um, <laughs> talks to chairs. The one thing about being on a national show, uh, a radio radio show, is a opposed to podcasting, um, all the things that I got into podcasting for originally, there are restrictions in radio. There's a a time clock, and there's what you can say and what you can't say, and rightfully so, because sponsors uh, provide it. If uh, in podcasting, you get sponsors that uh, if you do get, if one does get sponsors, you get sponsors who meet your ideology. But um, I'm sure Kraft, uh, Kraft Food doesn't doesn't want to hear what I think about the unholy trinity of the church, big business, and yeah. the government. Well, so, it, along uh, comes the death of creativity with the money. Uh, there was a, a wonderful moment and, uh, in, in my college um, years. Go ahead. I, in producing this show, as I have been uh, the one for Sports Byline, I have been faced with just that on so many different levels. Um, who to deal with, who to talk to, this one thinks this way, this way. If you look at all the people on Comfortably Zoned, the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, we are all in tune ideology-wise with a very, very few few exceptions, and we're able to skirt uh, political stuff in, in our interactions. But once there becomes money involved and you deal with people who um, you wouldn't be dealing with under, under certain cir- circumstances, it changes everything, and that's what's wrong with um, with artists, liberal arts, it, it just uh, the whole thing it just doesn't work because you've got to bring capitalism into it. Um, well, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking about today, I just went through this. There's a colleague of mine from the porn days, a woman, um, who. Well, I don't want to identify her because I think she's as dumb as the sack of hammers is the the bottom line. And she is a heavy, heavy right-wing proselytizer, and and everything right-wing is good. Everything liberal is dumb, uh, black and white, and um, unrelenting broadcaster uh, in in, uh, in Facebook uh, where I see her. And I just – I can't listen to it anymore. I just ended up um, deleting at least her her shit. It's not going to appear on my site anymore but my yeah, personal feeling about right now people are entitled to their opinion but when they put it on your site on one yeah I, I don't need to help further that madness but that's what i wanted to say is i'm more and more dealing with the problem 
now that we have dial your own facts and dial your own news, that we have people trying to make decisions all over this country being fed only one half the story or one side of the story. And that not going to work. <laughs> That's not going to work. You know, if, it doesn't. If, uh, I think I told you the story. It's so polarized that neither of us can see any good on the other on the other pole. Well, America won't work. America can't work that way. There, you know, there, it, we've got to have something where we're dealing with the same kind of information instead of all of, everything you say is bad and everything I say is good. Um, that, that's, you can't run a democracy that way. There's, there's no consensus because the whole thing is about either us or them. And then you have civil war, um, which is somewhere I really hope we're not headed. Um, for well, I, I can't, I don't think there'll be a civil war, but I think California some way down the line will fa- find a way of seceding from, from this nation. Well, that's civil war. There you go. I mean, that, that's, that's, well, that's the launch. Well, I don't know. Yeah. It, it gets uh, down to, if, it, if that happens, if that, that crack, that fissure happens, it gets down to who controls the army. And that, that's just the nature of power. And that, it's, it'll always be that way. And I, I don't hope we're not destined to go there. I still like the idea that America is a place where people can have different opinions and work them out. Uh, the Compromise of 1820. I mean, America has a history of, of compromising conflicting ideas with only one major um, break in the system, and that was in 1860, and that was the worst war we've ever been in, in terms of the number of casualties. Uh, well, how about a war that split this country? The Vietnam War split this country in every every bit as much as the Civil War. No, it didn't. We weren't shooting each other. We weren't killing each no, other. But, I, mean, but I agree that we were we were in a, in a were in polarized disarray. time, but it was different. Generations were in disarray. Yeah, there was there was argument on the land. There was, and it still is. You know, when you begin the show tonight, um, talking about or this afternoon, whenever people are listening, um, with you know you being in the military, I I was not in the military, um, and I was not in the military as a military choice. I thought patriotism at the time meant to not be in the military, and I feel like as I've gone through life now, one of my pet peeves is that those of us who protested the war are not being given our patriotic credit for thinking that that was more patriotic than serving in the war. Now, that in one major way to me is bullshit because I did not put my life on the line uh, any more than the, the, the threat of being beaten up in a demonstration. But that's different than lock and load and let's go to war. So I don't, that doesn't really compare. They're not equal. And I've made my peace with recognizing that. Um, it was one of the failures of the protesters during the Vietnam era to not recognize that the soldiers, as the police forces are in, in a political situation, are just as much victims as the people who are the victims of the, of the forces of oppression. Um, oh, they were drafted. They didn't just yeah, join. Yeah, exactly. The they did, they wasn't joined. going like, you know, we agree with all this shit. That, it didn't matter because America used to be a place where we had the illusion of trusting our politicians who meant well for the ideals of what the republic was supposed to stand for. Um, you know, all <laughs> life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness instead of but, you know, the pursuit of standard oil was profits. Was it ever and did it ever we were a country founded by slave owners? based on imperialism, and what we did to the Native Americans um, set the tone of yeah, um, yeah, Spanish-American yeah. War. You get, yeah. Well, you're getting real now. Once you get real, it all falls apart because there's, there's all the isms disappear, and it's just who has the guns, who has the right. power. <laughs> that, that's right. Um, that's what's really scary. But, you know, getting the word out... Um, is a good thing and it's cathartic and I'm glad we're able to do that. I'll miss that on radio the hour a week that our show is produced. Um, try to make up for it by being more outspoken on podcast. If I let me tell you uh, something that just happened this morning to me, uh, I've become uh, a binge reader in the last two weeks. 
Do you know the author Lee Child, who writes the Jack Reacher books? No, I don't. Okay. Briefly, Jack Reacher is six foot five and weighs 250 pounds, and he's an ex-13 years MP in the Army. Uh, he's now out of the Army. And the book, um, the books by Lee Child, there have been 21 of them. All 21 have been bestsellers on the New York Times bestseller list. This is something that's, that I didn't know about at all. Um, I haven't been a, been a fan of, of this kind of genre and the past mysteries that involve um, armies and, and fighting and this and that. Other than I like Bruce Lee movies back when. But anyway, I happened to read one of these books about 10 days, 12 days ago. And I fucking loved it. <laughs> and because it was a world I knew nothing about. And the, the, the Reacher character is like the tough, he's a tough guy's tough guy. So, and he, you, his military strategies are brilliant. And it, it, there was, I, I could just go on, one thing triggers another. But the, the reason I started telling this story is this. I've just finished one of the books. And in this, this the plot line, I've read, uh, it must be, let's see, this is the eighth book I've read in the last um, two weeks. Eight books back to back. I don't ever do this. And they're like 600-page books. <laughs> so anyway, the, the plot of this one was a guy who's essentially uh, a military hero. He's a pilot in Vietnam, and he's decorated, and uh, he ends up missing. And he's missing in action. And his parents now, 30 years later, are getting ready to die, and they don't know what happened to their son. And the Army has been stonewalling him and won't give them any answers. Somehow the character Jack Reacher becomes involved, and he's going to help them out and find out the answer. And 600 pages ensue, and he does find the answer. And he's reading, he's, he's saying this to the, to the parents at the end of the book, he, of their son. He said he was a hero, you know. The old man nodded. The old man said he did his duty. And Jack Reacher said, no, no, he did more than that. I read his record. I talked with General DeWitt. He was a brave flyer who did more than his duty. He saved a lot of lives with his courage. If he'd lived, he'd have three stars by now. He'd be general with a big command somewhere or a big job in the Pentagon. And after reading 600 pages about getting to this conclusion, I just started crying. <laughs> I, just, I really just laid in bed this morning and I was crying. And it reminded me when I was growing up before the division, which is where this whole conversation started about Vietnam, I was a John Wayne fan. I was an American fan. I believed the whole thing. Um, and that got taken away from me uh, in the Vietnam era. I was robbed of my opportunity to be for my country in terms of what I thought conventionally I would be, which is World War II. I mean, especially being a Jew. I mean, who the fuck could say no to that war? Uh, Absolutely. That was the war that made us all, as a nation, patriotic. Yeah, Patriotic. and yeah. it was the citizen army. It wasn't the professional army. That was something else, too, because it was the guy on the street. It was Frank Sinatra singing, you know, the things we believe, uh, that famous song from the, from the, I guess it was 30s. Um, well, that was I'll America tell you what it me. also was, as a baseball fan, we were both avid baseball fans. For me, it was, as I look back in the history, Pearl Harbor, you had Bob Feller re-enlist. -en you had people, Hank Greenwald re-enlisted. Hank Greenwald. Um, uh, uh, it was just instantaneous. The country absolutely rounded around, uh, you know, gathered around the wagons and, and all that. You had yeah. women in the, you know, the, the woman with, with the muscle, what, what was her name? That, Rosie, uh, the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter, right? She worked in a in a defense defense plant, and uh, yeah. it was a team effort. Uh, you had to buy the French women stockings. Everybody had had to save up. It was yeah. um, it was something. It had to do it. It was, it was all part of it. Um, yeah. And chocolates too. Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> my uh, mother was asking my father, "What do you want me to send chocolates for?" <laughs> <laughs> She never stopped talking about that after he came home. What were those chocolates for? <laughs> Sweet. Another, I have to tell you one more story because you, you triggered me with stockings. My father owned a gas station, and uh, after the war, he came, he came back and uh, went back to work in his gas station. And a guy came in to the station and opens up the trunk and shows him stockings. And uh, they were still a restricted item. Uh, 
1945 or so. And uh, he said he had he had 100 pair of stockings, and he had to, he was charging a ridiculous price for them. So my dad bought the whole hundred, <laughs> and he comes home so proud of himself and shows my mother the stockings, and he shows her the first pair. Well, there's a runner in it the size of Chicago. <laughs> They're no good. Every single pair <laughs> was runnered. <laughs> it was a hundred pairs of garbage. <laughs> and my mother never let my dad ever forget that. And I became, uh, I'm aware that the family business was to not be very good at business. <laughs> and I carried on that tradition. <laughs> Hey, you're basically, you and me, we do what we like in life. We don't, we're not on the grid. Is, how do people retire? Can you imagine people just not doing anything in retirement, not pursuing their passion? Um, well, I think in, in some ways I retired in 1984. Uh, with the first headline of the heterosexual transmission of AIDS. Uh, I was making a good living for about five or six years. After a, after a 10 year career, I finally kicked in around five where I became, uh, bankable, as they used to say. Um, but then AIDS came and, uh, I, my wife said, hey asshole, you just retired. Um, it, I had new babies at home and I was, I'd be risking her life and my life and their lives by continuing then, yeah. to, to have unprotected sex. And we didn't even know about that for a whole year, too, because safe sex wasn't part of the equation until 1986. Uh, anyway, that was my first retirement, and I, I, I really haven't recovered from that. I, uh, being a writer is <laughs> like a joke for, you know. I got a check for royalties yesterday for the year so far, $54 and two cents. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm not on the American. New York Times bestseller list. Whoa. Whoa. But I'm not retired, is what it is. I don't feel, no, I feel like my next career has to kick in yet. retired, um, how do people that do retire just turn it off? You're not retired. You they have money. They have, have enough money. Well, they have enough well, money to retire, which means that, what they were what, doing for, for all those years, they don't have to do it anymore. What occupies one's mind at that point? Anything you want. That's freedom. I mean, in some ways, that's the American dream of our generation right there. You put in your time, and you, 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 got, a, you got a nest egg, and you got Social Security, and you travel. You, take, you play with the grandkids. You, you learn how to speak Italian. I mean, whatever the fuck is your fancy. My brother's doing that. He was an eye surgeon and um, was dedicated. I mean, fucking dedicated. My brother was <laughs> a serious fellow. I mean, this is Harvard Med School. Uh, he ended up uh, five years ago at the age of 70 retiring, and he developed a personality. <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden, he's funny, and he's silly. My brother was never silly. The grandchildren have turned him into a human being. It's amazing to see what he's done since he stopped having to be the kind of person who was wired tight enough to cut your eye and not take your, eye, take your sight away. Um, so, you know... That's a positive retirement in in, in my uh, view because he's uh, he's earned the right to do whatever he wants at this point. And you have too. Money has nothing to do with it. We all well, have. I'm still not up to that yet. I mean, uh, I, I feel um, that's a place where I, you know I want to I want to have a big finish here. I have a model in my mind, uh, uh, an old girlfriend who I essentially was a first wife, but we were too cool to get married back then. Uh, her father was a chemist who had been heavily persecuted during the McCarthy eras, McCarthy uh, hearing eras. He was a former commie in the 30s and stuff. And uh, he, he made a career as a chemist, uh, but he, he didn't get to be the big time person in the science he wanted to be. And at the end of his life, he invented some kind of, toward the, toward the end of his business life, he came up with some... Um, pesticide or something that was good for killing rats or this or that without harming people. And he made some money. He made some money. Uh, so I'm looking for a big finish, too. I'd like to have yeah. one of my books become a movie, uh, you know, or else um, your show become real popular and I'll happen to be your your, your sidekick will be uh, Roy. And you can be Roy Rogers and I'll be Gabby well, Hayes, okay? That's my, we'll... my show, I'm smart enough to make it Lenny Randall's show and just produce it and co-host it. 
but Lenny Randall's the star. When we have a show, you'll be the star. I'm smart enough. Nah, we can share the billing. I don't. I don't need that anymore. I don't want the star. I just want the money. <laughs> All right. Well, I. If they ask me about a bill, I'll just say, I think I paid it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why don't I just send you the money and we won't have to converse? We'll, okay. <laughs> you got to be good with me. I like that. That's the kind of producer I am. That's the You, you can imagine what a, a future it will be in the Ralph Tycho produ- <laughs> production <laughs> world. A That's short why one. I'm, I'm leaving it all <laughs> to Lenny Randall. And and Darren Peck of Sports Byline USA. There you go. Um, send me send me the gelt when it comes. And if it yeah. doesn't come, don't send me anything. I'm just having fun doing what I do. It doesn't yeah. matter. Playgirl um, was going to give me. I did a. I was the first guy in Playgirl with an erection. And so they were going to do a poster and a big promotion. <laughs> and they said you're going to get. Uh, for every poster we sell, you're going to get a uh, dollar. I said, "Great! You know how much I made on that so far?" No, nothing, <laughs> nothing, uh, not a penny. I told you, you not get a penny. Of, um, yeah, sometimes, uh, but you could lie to me now. If you promise me stuff, lie to me. It's all right. Make me feel good for the minute. If I don't get, I'll be dead soon anyway. Well, that was kind of, you know, mild. The other one was being in the porn business. Uh, the money was uh, brought to the talent through a series of bufferists. So you really didn't know whose money it was. So when you're getting fucked in the porn business, which means like, they tell you they're going to pay you 500 a day and then they end up offering you 200 a day for your signature on the model release or whatever, um, well, you're going to sue them, right? <laughs> You, you sure you want to sue the Bonanno family? <laughs> I mean, or whatever family might be. I'm not using them as an example. I don't want to cast any aspersions here about the Bonanno. That's just the first one that occurred to me. Um, but in any case... Uh, I hope you'll listen to interviews that I do with a fellow by the name of Jack O'Halloran, who has written a book um, about his family. He is the son of... Uh, Albert Anesthesia. Oh my God, he was serious. And he was very, very serious guy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Maybe the three of us will get on together. Um, Jack's been a terrific guest. So he's not only he was a tenth ranked heavyweight boxer. Wow. Woman. He um, didn't win on, but beat up Norton in his career. He That's serious. was a movie star, not a star per se, but he played a, a role on Superman. He was uh, Superman's foe or whatever it was. Which Superman? Um, the movies or the TV or what? In the, the movie. No. The TV George Reeves. Movie. I mean, Steve Reeves. Yeah, remember those? Those were great. That was every afternoon. That, uh, Wait, Superman. I'm not clear yet. Are you talking about Christopher Reeves or George Reeves? No, we're talking about we're talk, talking about um, the TV, uh, the kid in the wheelchair, the, the actor that ended up in a wheelchair. I guess that's, that's Christopher Reeve. That's Christopher. Okay. George yeah, I was thinking. I got him confused with Steve. Remember Steve Reeve? Watching on the little black and white screen, yeah. and um, we didn't know it, but Lois Lane looked good to us. For we were just both kidding. of them. There were two of them. Two Lois Lanes. Yeah, they were in the middle of the series. They fired the one and put another one in there. If you look, if you oh. go back and see the reruns, you'll see there's two Lois Lanes. Interesting. Interesting. Um, always wondered what a cub reporter was about. That was Jimmy Olsen. Jimmy, yes. Well, that's what I, you know, about two weeks ago when Ray we ended the show. Caesar's ghost. Yeah, yeah, Perry White. About two weeks An ago when you ended the show. A curmudgeon. Yeah. I'm seven, and I wanted to be a curmudgeon. I don't know why. <laughs> you, you told me at the end of one of the first shows we did, next week we were going to discuss my career as a sports writer. And I was uh, Jimmy Olsen. I was the cub reporter. I was 18 years old working for a Scripps Howard newspaper as a, as a sports writer. So well, I, had, I had that experience. 
Well, let's do this. This has been um, been a good show, and I want to keep that. Let's put that down for next week, and we'll talk about sports writing. How about okay. that? I'll tell you what. Uh, let's record a little thing about being a cub reporter as a sports writer. Well, I'll record a little thing for um, for the show, should, the radio show, you and I. Sure. Beautiful. Good. And um, we'll talk about it on the podcast next week, but uh, we'll get together and we'll do a, uh, what I like to call a tight ten. And um, we won't curse. We won't say anything bad. We won't politicize in any way. All right, let me let me look at something here. Next week is um, the 18th. No, next is the 5th, the 11th. Okay, good. I'm leaving town for three weeks on the 13th, so that would be the week after. But you're talking about the 11th, so I'll do okay. uh, I'll, I'll it. Now, calendar. you're not being run out of town. I just want clarification on that. For no, I have a, a mother-in-law who is um, 98 years young and is on her way out and uh, a lot of dementia. And um, the oldest, my my, uh, my sister-in-law, needs to get out of town. She's been doing the primary help uh, with the care. And uh, there's, my wife is her younger sister, and so we need to go and be there for three weeks while she gets a vacation. So we'll be uh, first line of defense. And, um, well, um, uh, you're um, doing what needs to be done. And, um, exactly. I'm sorry you have to go through it, but it's... It's all part of life. Yeah, I've done it twice with my own parents, so I know the I know the ride. Yeah. Thank you for being here, sir. Appreciate Pleasure it. to meet you. Howie Gordon. Um, and well, I wanted to ask you uh, something before we close. Yes. You a couple of times have referred to me as Howie Rose. I don't know where that comes from. I'll t- I could tell you where that comes from. It would have to be off the air. My friend Marty Rose. Um, could be that, but Howie Rose, I guess I told you it's on the air, is a, the Met television announcer. And oh. my best friend growing up, he has a show, show with me on the New York Mets, um, uh, along with Robert Cole, on this very network, he is named Marty Rose. So Howie Rose, Howie Gordon, um, that's where that's where it comes from. Okay, I just wanted um, to. I thought you had um, struck Ralph a new Mark nickname for typo? me. Mar- Mar- Ralph Mark um, uh, screw up the name O as well. Uh, <laughs> not just my typing. And uh, <laughs> I like the name. It was a good one. It was a good one. Yeah, Howie Rose. Uh, Howie Rose. Um, it works for the, It works for the TV announcer of the New York Mets, Marty and Bonnie. His brother, it works for um, for them as well. Uh, I wish it would work for you. I couldn't convince you to put Gordon, <laughs> Gordon down. I feel like Charlie Finley wanted to make Vita Blue true blue. <laughs> I know. Charlie <laughs> Finley. Choose the name. Change his name. Um, Have you ever met Barry Gifford, by the way? I haven't. Barry Gifford is a writer, who uh, a good writer, and a good friend from years ago. We were on the same softball team and stuff. Uh, he wrote a book called The Neighborhood of Baseball, uh, growing up a Cubs fan. And this was about, Jesus, about 25, 30 years ago now. And it was, um, the, the Major League Baseball liked it so much, they gave him a lifetime pass to all the games everywhere, which is how they used to honor oh, wow. writers who, who broke through. So Barry might be an interesting person for you to talk to. And I'll, well, I'll talk to how about Barry being an interesting person that the three of us could get on the air, that you bring him on? All right, you know, I'll give him a call. See if he's he's done some Hollywood movies. Next week. He's, he's, well, I don't know. I'll have to you know track him down and see if I can get yeah, him and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you could help in the production of your segments. How about that? Hey, hey, I used to run the trolley in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> we got that to talk about, the, about <laughs> that. You can tell the inside story of, of being a, uh, a crew member. Um, you were actually, of dealing with the interaction, I'll 
just curious because when I was a kid, I used my mother would take my brother and I down to these games, these kids shows. Uh-huh. Uh, Maury Amsterdam was a host yeah. of one of them, yeah. and um, we we'd sit there and um, basically doing the same thing you did, sitting around and. Um, it, it was fun, fun times, and I'll bet it was fun for you doing it. Do you remember A Thousand Clowns, the film and play? I do. You have to goose yeah. the world now and again. Yeah, prove yeah. Prove that you're yeah. a human being, yeah. not a chair. Chuckles the chipmunk. Yes. <laughs> Why did you uh, quit? Why did you quit? Well, I felt like I wasn't reaching all the kids out there in TV land. <laughs> That's right. The frustration Murray. of an entertainer. Murray. <laughs> Murray. And Barry Gordon. Barry Gordon played the kid. I always loved that because he had the same name as me. Same name. Barry Gordon. Um, was he the record producer too? No. A, he he had a hit Barry record Gordon. though. When he was when he was twelve years old, he sang "I'm Getting Nothing for Christmas," but he had a hit record. <laughs> that Barry Gordon. Yeah, you'd recognize oh. his face when you saw him. He was a child star that never really blossomed as a grown-up. Um, the well, the, the record blossomed. producer was was uh, Barry B E R R Y. That was Motown. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was Mo. That was. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he had um, something to do with the Shirelles. Yeah, all those groups. All in Detroit. The, yeah. Um, Be my baby. The Ronettes. Yeah, the do run, 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 the do run, run. <laughs> All of it. Good days, Barry. Good memories. Thank you, sir. Yeah, All right. I should call you Barry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that, that, that's a Barry, Barry Gordon. Barry I'm a rose Gordon among rose. thorns. <laughs> Barry Gordon Rose used to be Harry. Yeah. There we go. Uh, A.K.A. 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 I love talking to you, my friend. Talk soon. Right. If you're listening out there, I may wonder why Barry may <laughs> Barry <laughs> Gordon, Howie Rose Gordon Rose might, might wonder why. But Don't forget want... Richard Pacheco. He's here too. Uh, I yes, I want you folks to do us a solid. If you enjoyed any of it, if you enjoy any of the shows on the network, this is serious. Box up some gently used children's books and take them down to head start. Kids need to read. They need to develop an imagination. They need to get their noses out of the devices. And most of all, they need to be school ready. They cannot afford to fall behind. It's just the way of it. And the kids that will be benefiting are the kids that really do need the head start. Okay? It's like, um, this is real clear. You'll be helping. Box them up, get a food, get a drive going in, in the neighborhood, get as many books to these kids as, as possible, and uh, I'll feel good. Thank you. Thank you again, Howie Gordon. You're Howie a good man, Gunga Dan. All right. See you soon, friend. Bye-bye.